Hi, can you hear Hello. me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, good. I'm just opening. Yes. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, good. What about you? I'm doing well. This is the last webinar. <laughs> okay, so I'm the last one. <laughs> yes. Okay. And you will do good, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, so basically, uh, when I start, I will do like a small introduction and uh, then you can share your screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you finish your talk, you can stop sharing your screen. So when the questions part starts, then there's only two of us on the screen. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, just in case, can you tell me how I uh, say your first name? Uh, Ahmed. Ahmed. Yes. Okay, great. Okay. So yeah. then I won't say it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, can I try sharing my screen? Uh, yeah, sure. Sure. All right. So can you see my yep. slides and then I press slideshow? Yes, working perfectly. And uh, do you see the laser pointer? Yep. Okay, good. Then we're ready to go. Nice. I will start exactly at eight. So there's a little bit, a few minutes. Okay. So uh, since you are the host, uh, can you force uh, to stop sharing if I'm not able to do because uh, like it happened once or twice before that uh, I don't see the stop sharing button? Um, I'm not sure actually. I can share again if you... I don't think I can. Yeah, you can share again and then I will look. Um, no, I mm -hmm. can't. I don't think so because you're also the host. Like, there's an opportunity that uh, if you can't stop, then I will like not make you a co host and then I can stop. Okay. Yep. Okay, welcome everyone. I hope you are doing well. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Marian and I'm an international marketing specialist at the University of Tartu. I am very happy to welcome you to the Alumni Talks 2023 event and I will be your host today. Alumni Talks is our new series where our fantastic alumni share their story of studying at the University of Tartu and uh, they will give a short lecture on a topic they chose. So uh, today I am here with Ahmed who is from Egypt and graduated from the Software Engineering Master's program at the University of Tartu in 2021. Before his studies, Ahmed worked in Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And uh, during his studies, he was an intern at Swedbank as a software engineer in Group Data Warehouse, where he was promoted to a full-time software engineer. Currently, he is working at uh, Moniz as a data engineer. And uh, today, he's going to talk about data warehouse modeling using Data Vault 2.0 in fintech companies. 
And uh, also a few words before we get started. If you have any questions during the webinar, please leave them to the Q&A box. We will address them at the end of the webinar. If you have any technical difficulties, please contact us and uh, we will try to help you resolve them. And uh, also we are recording today's talk and all participants will receive a recording after the webinar. But uh, now, without further ado, I would like to give a floor to our presenter today. So, Ahmed, if you are ready, you can yes, start. Yes, I'm ready. So let me share my screen. <laughs> so I hope you can see it. Yes. And okay. uh, thanks, Marion, for a nice introduction. So uh, hello, everyone. I'm Ahmed. And I am from Egypt. And uh, yeah, as uh, Mario mentioned, I was graduated from Tartu University in Software Engineering in 2021. And uh, now I'm working uh, as a data engineer at uh, Moniz. And uh, today's topic is data warehouse modeling using Data Vault 2.0 in fintech companies. And before I start, I would like just to give a small introduction from my perspective. So I am Ahmed and I am graduated uh, from a master's in uh, software engineering with Com Lauda. And I was graduated in 2021. And uh, I am now working uh, uh, as a data engineer at Moniz. And I'm also external PhD student uh, uh, in Tartu University. So, and uh, my story, how I reached to uh, Tartu University. So uh, I was working in the industry for more than eight years before I uh, decided to come for master's. And uh, then I uh, I start looking in Europe in different places and uh, I faced lots of bureaucracy in, in several countries. And then I heard about Estonia and uh, their digital innovation and how they are a country that is uh, like focusing on technology and uh, this is their main uh, focus. Uh, and uh, then I start reading about the, the country and the universities and uh, the programs and I was really fascinated with their system and how everything is uh, <clears throat> like clear and uh, and uh, everything is available online. You can find all the information you need by just uh, looking uh, on, on, on the web. And even the applying process is quite easy and uh, straightforward uh, through uh, Dream Apply, which is a unified system where you can just apply to all the universities in in Estonia from one place. So you don't <clears throat> you don't need to to contact each university uh, uh, separately. And then I got accepted in Tartu University in software engineering uh, with Twitter waiver. And uh, during my studies in in, uh, in masters, I uh, got uh, internship at Swedbank in Group Data Warehouse uh, for six months, and then I I uh, I, uh, I moved to a full time uh, uh, data engineer at Swedbank, and uh, yeah, now I'm working at Moniz as a data engineer. So that is uh, the history about how I reached to Tartu uh, University. And uh, now let's move to our topic. So our topic is uh, data warehouse modeling uh, using Data Vault 2.0 standard uh, in fintech company. And the agenda for today is what is Data Vault 2.0 and uh, what are the benefits of Data Vault and uh, what is architecture uh, used there and uh, a modeling example using Data Vault and uh, then uh, the main object uh, types uh, used in Data Vault and uh, modeling approaches. So Data Vault uh, is a data modeling technique and not only modeling, it has also methodology, architecture for build building enterprise data warehouse. And it was created by Dan uh, Lindstedt and uh, in, in early 2000, and this was version 1.0, and it was only focusing on the modeling part, and it didn't uh, <clears throat> mention or describe what should be the method or the architecture uh, there. And then Data Vault 2.0 was released in 2013 as an extension to version 1.0. And it includes lots of improvement <clears throat> to the older uh, version. Uh, plus, it also mentioned about the methodology and the architecture to build a full data warehouse. And uh, the benefits of Data Vault 2.0, it provides a long term historical storage. So it stores historized data, and even data ch changes are also historized 
uh, in data vault and it also enables auditability traceability and loading speed uh, through parallel uh, processing or parallel <coughs> lo loadings and it is also resilient to change in the business environment so if there is any changes in business requirements and this is uh, really the case it always been in business every uh, few months or few years you have the new business requirements and you need to adapt to these changes so the model is is really resilient to changes and it also provide a rapid and agile uh, development and the fast time to market and this is the best part because it follows as a agile methodology so you can do iterations you can build something then you can extend that to next uh, in next iteration and keep extending until you have like the perfect model so you don't need to design everything from scratch you can just start and then with time you will <clears throat> build on top of it until you reach uh, a good uh, model and it also support insert only uh, loading strategy and uh, by <clears throat> but what it means by insert only it means that uh, you're, you you can just insert to the model you don't need to do any updates if there is any data changes in source system you can just insert the new data and you keep inserting without doing any updates and this reduced uh, the reduce the maintainability in the system and if you see in, in the figure here, so the model basically consists of three main objects, so hubs and links and satellites objects. And uh, you can see that hubs are uh, uh, modeled and then each hub is connected to a few satellites and uh, hubs are connected together through link tables and link tables also can have satellite tables and we'll go deeply into these details uh, in the next uh, slides. So now about the architecture of Data Vault 2.0. So uh, as any data warehousing uh, uh, solution or enterprise data warehouse solution, you have first source systems and these source systems uh, like databases, like file, uh, file, file, CSV files or XML files, or even APIs or even uh, messaging system, uh, messaging from uh, 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 several uh, systems like Kafka, for example. And then you start loading uh, the data to your main model, uh, to your uh, landing area, which is a staging area. So this is the first step. You start uh, loading all the data to a staging area, which is a temporary storage, where you just store the data uh, without doing any changes as is from the source system to your uh, data warehouse. And then from the landing area, you start loading the data to uh, the data vault model. And in data vault model, so uh, the first area is called uh, raw vault and in raw vault you start uh, modeling uh, the data and loading it to to a data vault structures like as i mentioned hubs or links or satellites and in raw vault uh, you you you, st you try to keep the data as uh, uh, as equal to source as possible so you don't do changes in the data you, st you just uh, store the data in the data vault structure without without applying any uh, soft rules and uh, you can only apply uh, some uh, hard rules uh, by changing some data types uh, adding uh, some metadata columns because uh, data vaults, vault also introduced some new uh, metadata uh, columns that is necessary to store uh, the data uh, for auditability and after you store the data in the raw vault you start uh, uh, building your business vault and business vault is the area where you start applying your business rules or your soft rules uh, and these soft rules are for example removing uh, null values or replacing them qualiski with any other value or um, do some mappings in the data do some consolidations so this is where you apply the business uh, rules and after you build uh, the business uh, vault you you start feeding your presentation uh, layer and in presentation layer it is the area where you build your dimensional model the usual dimensional model uh, using kanban for example where you <clears throat> you build some uh, fact table or dimensions uh, uh, and the, the dimensions and uh, yeah, this is the area where it is optimized for reporting so uh, <clears throat> the data vault by itself is not optimized for reporting and you will see that in next slides why it happens 
and that's why you build the presentation layer uh, where you store the data uh, in a more uh, business oriented way uh, using Kanban and uh, then uh, the consumers will start uh, reading from uh, the presentation uh, layer. And uh, you have also operational vault and this is a small vault where it is uh, uh, you can do some interfaces uh, for example, some external services can do API calls uh, to the data vault and they can uh, read small chunks of data. For example, what is the transaction state? Uh, what is the order status? Uh, uh, what is the employee de details? So a few uh, small API calls that can be uh, consumed directly from the data uh, vault. And Data Vault by itself is not optimized uh, for reporting, uh, so you cannot uh, 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 write reports uh, on top of the raw vault. Uh, and that's why it's better to build the business vault and the presentation layer, which is more optimized for such purposes. And about the main object types, so we have three main object types in Data Vault. So the first one is called hubs. So hubs table is tables which stores the business keys. So any business key we receive from source systems, uh, we store the, we store in hubs uh, table. For example, employee uh, ID or order number, or invoice number. So all this information it has a business key which is the order number or the invoice number. So we store these details in hubs table. And then we have link uh, tables and link table stores the relationship. So it only stores the relationship between hubs. So you, for example, you have a customer and you have an invoice and what is the relationship between uh, customer one and uh, invoice one. So this relation is maintained in, in the link uh, table. And the satellite table, it, uh, it only stores the descriptive data. So any attributes in the data that is stored, for example, in employee table, you have the first name, the last name, the date of birth, uh, all these descriptive attributes are stored in uh, satellite uh, tables. And also satellite table historizes uh, the data. So if any changes happen in source system, in the data vault, in the satellite, we, we insert a new record uh, with a new uh, data, with a new uh, start date or load date. So it also keep a chain, uh, keep history of, of these descriptive fields if any changes happen in source system. So these are the three main uh, object types. And let's take them one by one. So let's start with the hub. So as I mentioned, the hub table keep track of the business keys. And uh, what I mean by business keys, any key that is uh, represented by the business or used by the business, for example, invoice number. Invoice number is a business key, so it can be uh, stored in hub and also order number, uh, employee uh, ID or uh, email address. So all these are business keys. So all the business keys are stored in a hub table and the hub table creates surrogate keys on top of the business keys uh, to be used in, in joins. And if you see the example here, this is a hub uh, employee table and it has a column uh, called employee B key, business key. And uh, this business key is the one we receive from source systems. And we have uh, an S key, a surrogate key column, and this surrogate key column is uh, it is just a surrogate key, and uh, and it it is only used when you join the hub with any other uh, table in your model. And then you have load timestamp, and this is a metadata column that is uh, uh, recommended to have. And when this uh, record was uh, created in in the data warehouse. And this, uh, there is also record source, and this is another metadata column, uh, which stores uh, from where uh, this uh, column, uh, this uh, row is coming from. Because in enterprise data warehouse, you might have several uh, source systems, and uh, you may receive information about employees from two places, for example. So you need to keep track from which system you, you receive the data. So. Uh, and this uh, surrogate key column, it can be integer. So it is. it can be just a sequence where it starts from one, two, three. And with every time you insert a new data, you need to see the maximum and then insert a new uh, record. Uh, but this technique is not uh, very efficient. So in Data Vault 2.0, they recommend to use binary. 
uh, which is a hashed uh, value for the business key. So you can use any hashing function like MD5, SHA, or uh, any other hashing function where you hash the business key and create the, uh, the hashed version in the S key. And this also provide uniqueness uh, in the S key uh, field. And uh, yeah, the main columns are just the surrogate key, which is the primary key that is used in joins and the business key and the load timestamp and the record uh, source. The second object uh, or table in data vault is called link table and link table, as I mentioned, it keeps track of the relationships. And uh, what I mean relationship is, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, what is the relation between uh, one business key to another business key. So it's not a table relation, it is the, like the data itself uh, relation. And the link table represents many to many relationship between hops. And uh, I will explain uh, why uh, in the next uh, slides. So uh, so it, it always represents many to many. So if you see the example, this is a link table and it has a foreign key to the first hub, which is employee, for example, and it have another uh, foreign key uh, to store. And uh, this is another hub, uh, which is called store. Uh, and uh, and yeah, you see it has also its own primary key. So at the end, it, it represents a many to many relation between uh, two hubs. And uh, it can have multiple hubs. It is not only necessarily to be two hubs. You can uh, connect the three hubs together in one link table. So it's not only two uh, hubs. So you can have more. And it also creates surrogate keys, as I mentioned, like this link employment S key. And uh, this is also recommended to be binary where you hash both uh, hub hash keys together. So you concatenate them and you hash them again in order to get this S key. And uh, yeah, the main column types, as I mentioned, is the S key uh, surrogate key, which is a primary key, and uh, the hops uh, surrogate keys, which are foreign keys, and you can have more. And then you can or you also have load timestamp and record source similar to the hub uh, record. So this table structure doesn't have any descriptive data uh, from source. It's only uh, storing the relationship between uh, the hub uh, the hubs records. And it have some uh, uh, variants, so uh, you can create a usual uh, standard link, as I showed you in the example. There is also something called same as link, which is a self uh, like self join or a self link, like link between two records in the same hub. It's called same as link. There is also transactional link uh, or non historizing links uh, to model the transactions. And there is also hierarchical links. So each type of links have some use cases and uh, you can uh, use any of them based on, on the use case you have. And uh, uh, the third uh, object type or table is called satellite tables and satellite tables keeps track of descriptive data. And the uh, descriptive data means any attributes uh, in, in source system, we store them in satellite tables. And uh, the and uh, it stores the descriptive data about hubs or a link table. So uh, a satellite can be connected to a hub or a link. And it has only one parent. So you cannot create a satellite that's connected to two uh, hubs or one hub and one link in the same time. So one satellite is only connected to one hub or one link. So it has only one parent table. And the satellite keep a history uh, for changes in the data. So if you receive, uh, if there is a change in the data, uh, you, you insert a new record with the new uh, data you have. So you don't replace the data, you don't update it. In some uh, implementations, they put end date uh, to the previous record and insert a new record. Uh, in some other implementation, if you follow the insert on only approach, then you don't update the previous record, you just insert the new data. You don't update, it's only insert only approach. And uh, this is one example, which is satellite employee details. So it has uh, uh, a reference to the hub uh, that is connected to, and it has also another field called hash diff. And hash diff is hash representation for all the attributes, all the descriptive data. You create you create a hash diff, 
because when you receive a new record or if you receive a changes in the data, you don't want to, to check if all the attributes 20 or 25 attributes exist or, or not in, in, in your system in order to decide to insert or not. So you create a hash diff, which is hashed value for all the attributes, and you can only compare with hash diff. So if hash diff is, exists, it means that this record exists. If it doesn't exist, then you insert the new data. And then you have also record source and load timestamp as the usual, what we had in other uh, tables. And then you have all the attributes that you, you, you get from a source uh, system. So for example, employee details can be first name, last name, uh, date of birth, all this information, you, you, you can add them here in the satellite table. And uh, both these fields together uh, uh, make the uniqueness, and uh, this is a primary key. So it is a composite key between the employee, uh, the hub uh, hash key, and uh, the hash diff uh, column. Uh, because uh, one employee can have multiple records here, so you cannot use uh, the hub uh, surrogate key as a primary key. You need always to have another uh, field to provide the uniqueness. And uh, these are the main column types, as I mentioned. And uh, there are also some variants uh, available in data vault. So there is something called multi-active satellite. So you, uh, you have multiple active records at the same time. So for example, contact details, you have email, you have uh, a phone number, and both records are active in the same time. So it's usually stored in a multi-active satellite. There is also effectivity satellite, which is a satellite connected to a link table, which stores when this relation starts and end in the link table. And there is also something called conformed satellite or a business vault satellite, which you apply some business rules on top of the, the usual uh, satellite. So these are different variants. And there are other uh, object types as well, so uh, which we will not go into all of them today uh, due to time. So the first one is called reference table, and uh, uh, there is also point in time table and the bridge tables, uh, business hubs, conformance satellites, and uh, these are available in business vault. And this reference tables are, is in row vault. Uh, uh, so uh, these are other uh, uh, types uh, of the tables that is used in data vault and it has its own purpose and based on the use case you need to de de design your uh, your uh, tables accordingly and now let's go to a small uh, modeling example so uh, uh, this this example is basically from Wikipedia, and I just uh, modeled the third uh, normal form, which is a source uh, system. So in source system or in third normal form uh, system, you have employee table and store table, and the store has a store ID, which is a primary key, store name, and store location. And uh, these are descriptive data. And here in employee, you have employee ID, which is the primary key. You have a link to the store. So each employee is assigned to one store. And then you have a first name, last name, address, and phone. These are also descriptive data. So if you start uh, translating that into uh, raw data vault, so you have basically two uh, entities, or uh, in data vault, there will be two hubs. Uh, because we have employee uh, business key and you have the store uh, uh, details. And uh, and then there is a relation between them. So this is considered a link table. And then you have satellite uh, for employee details that stores the descriptive data, another satellite for store uh, to store, uh, for, for the store to store the, uh, the descriptive data. And if you check what happens in data vault, so this example shows it. And uh, this is from Wikipedia, as I mentioned. So there is hub employee. And uh, this hub employee have the same uh, metadata and it has the business key, which is, uh, for example, employee ID. And it has uh, the primary key or the surrogate key column. And uh, there is also another hub for store. And also it has a business key coming from store and the same uh, metadata. 
and the relation between them is defined in this link table. So we have link employment and this link employment have foreign key to the store and another foreign key to the uh, hub. And then you have a record data and record source and uh, it has its own primary key. And why it has its own primary key? Because you can have a satellite table connected to the link. And uh, this hub have uh, satellites. So this satellite stores the first name and last name. And this satellite stores employee address and employee phone. Uh, and it has foreign key to the hub uh, uh, surrogate key. So this satellite is only connecting to one hub. So you cannot have a satellite that connects to multiple hubs. And uh, similarly here, you have also a satellite uh, that have the store name and store location. And uh, this is uh, when uh, this uh, relation starts and when this relation ends. So this is uh, like uh, uh, an effectivity satellite, which is connected to this link table in order to store when the relation uh, employment starts and when it ends. And uh, yeah, if you see now how the model looks, uh, in certain normal form, it was just two tables. But then in data vault, you start modeling it into seven tables. And that's why I mentioned that data vault is not optimized for reporting, because if you want to just build a small report on top of uh, employee and the store data, you need to query from seven different places. So that's why uh, I mentioned initially that data vault is not very optimized uh, for, for reporting and you need to build the business vault layer uh, to create some big table that connects several satellites together, then build dim some dimensions and facts in order to, to get the information that business needs. So uh, you, it is not uh, like very wise to just query from the data vault and use it for your reporting needs. And uh, I mentioned before that link table uh, provide many to many relationship. And actually this is one of the requirements for data vault because, uh, and why is that? Because um, uh, business needs can, can change over time. And uh, for example, here the re relation is one to many. So one employee is assigned to one store and only one. But maybe after one year or two years, the business needs it changes, and you have a manager that uh, that manage five or six uh, stores in the same time. So, uh, so if you build your model, your data vault model uh, with uh, something like not many to many relation, then you need to change your model. But with with this requirement, you build every relation as many to many. Uh, basically with a link table and uh, this will make it uh, more uh, like uh, 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 more ready for changes in the business needs so if there is a changes it will you it, it will fit in the same model you don't need to change your model so uh, this is one of the good uh, recommendations and requirements for data vault and uh, now about the modeling approaches. So basically when you start thinking about how to model uh, uh, your data vault model, uh, so you have like uh, several approaches to do that. And the first one is called bottom up approach. And in bottom up approach, which is AKA source driven. Uh, so it means you only look at the source systems you you check the metadata as we uh, as we done now we just we didn't understand what is the business needs at all we just uh, check that there is a table called employees there is a table called store there is a relation these are the descriptive data and then based on that you design your data vault model so this is called bottom up approach so you don't look at business needs at all you just look at the source systems and what is the relations between them and you you build your your model based on that and uh, uh, you only re rely on, on the source system and the metadata there. And the second approach is called the top down, down approach, which is just the opposite. So it is business driven or business centric design approach. Uh, where you start only from business needs. So what is your business needs? What are the use cases? And uh, and then you start building your dimensional uh, model or the presentation layer, which uh, has solves the business needs. Then you build your business vault and then you, you build your raw vault. So you, you don't look at all at the source system. 
And then you need to figure out from which source system you need to get the data that fits uh, this model. So you build the model uh, like isolated from the actual data. And then you need to figure out from where you get the data and then uh, load it to your model. And the third approach is called the combined or hybrid approach, where you combine both techniques together. And, uh, and uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, hubs and links uh, follow the top-down approach. So in order to define a hub or a link, uh, uh, you need to check the business and what, what the business uh, means by this uh, business keys. And then you build your hubs and links. And satellite table, you can follow the bottom-up approach. So in satellite, you need to look at the source system, what descriptive fields we have, and then uh, get them to the data warehouse. So these are the different uh, modeling approaches uh, available. And uh, there are some pros and cons uh, for each approach. So there is no right answer which one to choose. So for example, if we take the top-down approach where you start from the business needs and uh, use cases, so it's easier to use definitely because you build your model uh, uh, looking at the business needs in mind. So it's very optimized for business. So it's easier to use or consume data from, uh, and it has less hubs and the unified structure. Uh, but the cons, it requires understanding of business. So before you start building your data vault, you need to understand first your business, define the, uh, the, the use cases, and then start uh, thinking about uh, what, uh, uh, how the business need to calculate uh, reports, and then start building your model on top of that. So it always starts from business needs, and it takes more time to implement because you have to understand the business quite well. And it doesn't fit all data because you only focus on business side. So maybe business need a few uh, areas and they don't need the other uh, full uh, picture. So so it, uh, when you, you, you start loading the data, maybe some data you cannot fit into your uh, model. And in bottom-up approach, it is easier to implement. Uh, uh, because you only focus on the source system, you know the metadata, you know the relation, uh, you can easily uh, uh, define the links and the hubs and the satellites. And even there are lots of automation tools in the market that you can use, uh, which uh, do some discovery and they collect the metadata from source system and they built your data vault model for you. But on the other hand, uh, these are a very technical view of the data. So you only look at the technical implementation and you don't look at the business needs. And it's also harder to understand and use because uh, as we saw in, in this example, instead of having two tables, you, you already created seven tables. And uh, when you start using them, it will be uh, quite harder to use. So uh, and that's why the comb where the combined approach is uh, is uh, is there where you you just need to find the sweet spot between both approaches and uh, figure out like which uh, 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 technique to use. And uh, yeah, I think that's uh, all. And I hope the session was uh, beneficial. And uh, and uh, now I will stop sharing and uh, let's uh, start to to see your questions. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for this exciting talk. And uh, as you already said, it is time for some questions from our audience. And uh, just a reminder, please type your questions to the human day box. So uh, I will uh, start with the first question. And the first question is, how did you manage to work and study at the same time? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, it is a bit challenging, and uh, but but it's also like uh, 
Uh, there is a, a dedicated module for practical uh, knowledge in, in software engineering. So uh, it is like a norm that everyone is looking for an internship during study and you have like credits uh, that supports that. So uh, so so the university is already aware that you, you, you need to get these practical uh, uh, credits and uh, you can do it uh, through uh, external uh, internship like what I did at Swedbank, Bank or you can also do it in, in a lab in the university under the supervision of uh, uh, any uh, uh, doctor and uh, yeah there are like lots of ways to do it uh, but everyone have to to do some practical work and uh, and uh, yeah when you see that everyone is doing the same and uh, and it's also already like uh, planned in in the curriculum so uh, yeah, you you can manage it uh, it is not uh, uh, the big deal to to manage both i would say Okay, thank you very much. So the next question is, have you participated in the industrial masters program and could you share your experience? Uh, <clears throat> when I joined the, uh, the university, I was excited about the program uh, because I, I I already worked in the industry for more than eight years, so I, I get used to to work and <laughs> not study. <laughs> uh, so uh, I was excited to apply, but I didn't get the chance uh, to be in the program. Uh, so I cannot share much experience about how it works. Uh, and uh, But I think on, on the University of Tartu website, you can see lots of information about the program. And uh, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite, uh, even there are some presentations, I think, uh, about it. Uh, but it is a really good uh, opportunity where you can combine your studies with, uh, with the industry and uh, try to do your masters related to the industry. So, so yeah, it's quite nice. And I hope I, I had the chance to participate. Okay, thank you. So uh, the next question is about uh, the program structure. Can you tell some of your favorite courses and uh, what optional courses did you take and would recommend? Mm -hmm. That is quite hard because I don't uh, remember like all the <laughs> the exact courses, but uh, uh, but like in general, all the courses were uh, quite exciting. Uh, and the University of Tartu try to do a balance between the practical coding uh, courses and also about the theoretical part. Uh, usually I am a practical person and I like practical things and I, I always hate uh, theoretical uh, like uh, stuff, but, uh, but at University of Tartu, even the business related courses or the management courses were quite nice uh, because they focus much on the industry. So they don't teach you something that you will never see so uh, whatever course you choose even if it's not a technical course uh, you will find it very related to the industry and uh, so far I still sometimes go and uh, remember something from the course that I may need uh, in, in my work and, uh, and it, it is really exciting so uh, around 98 or 99 percent of the courses I, I, I was really excited about uh, in general, there are uh, like mandatory uh, courses, so which is the core module that you have to 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 pass, uh, to 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 take, and then you have some optional uh, courses and the elective uh, courses that you need to choose, uh, and uh, and this also gives you a freedom to choose whatever uh, course uh, you want. So if you are interested in in, for example, machine learning, and it's not part of the program, you can still take the course. Uh, so that is really a good uh, opportunity. Okay, thank you. So next question is, what was your background, uh, your bachelor's degree before you started the master's program at the University of Tartu? So my bachelor's was in uh, communications and electronics uh, engineering. So it was still engineering, but not software engineering. Uh, but I took uh, like uh, several programming courses and even after graduation, I worked with data a lot in, in lots of companies. So, so I was in the IT industry, uh, but my bachelor was in uh, communications and electronics and I was graduated in 2010. So I, I worked for more than eight or nine years before I joined masters. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so next question would be, 
Are there any special specializations at your program? And uh, which one did you choose and why, if there were any? Uh, there was uh, enterprise uh, 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 applications, I think. And there was another one, but uh, but I took this enterprise uh, one. Uh, I, I don't remember the, the second one, uh, but but yeah, I took the enterprise one. And uh, it was really good because uh, uh, they uh, like I already had experience with data and uh, enterprise data warehousing and uh, seeing how enterprise applications are built uh, from development perspective. It was really interesting to me. And uh, and yes, I, I thought that will fit my experience and will build on, on top of it. So I chose that, uh, that specialization. Okay, thank you. So next question is, uh, what is or are the most complex software engineering tasks or projects that you have completed during your studies? Um about the tasks so each uh, course even if it is a theoretical one you will have uh, some practical work that you need to do or some projects that you need to fulfill and uh, for me i think uh, uh, enterprise software engineering was uh, one of the courses that were uh, was initially challenging to me because uh, it was using java spring boot and uh, i didn't have that uh, java experience before uh, and we had to do a project uh, and we have to do like uh, four or five uh, uh, derivables. So it, it was uh, yeah, a bit a bit challenging. I had to learn Java, Spring Boot and uh, some colleagues were having uh, some experience. So I, I, I saw the difference in, in, in my performance and their performance. But yeah, at the end, I got A in this subject and <laughs> it was quite challenging, but, uh, but I, I was like into it and I had, I, I want to understand how uh, uh, back end and uh, back end development work so for me it was quite interesting and i managed to get high grades well very well done thank you um so next question is have you participated in programming challenges or contests hackathons or extracurricular activities in software engineering or related fields during your studies? Um, I haven't participated in a challenge, uh, challenges, uh, but because like I was fully occupied with the internship, uh, I think usually to, to fulfill your practical module, you need three months uh, uh, internship, but I had six months uh, internship at Swiss Bank, so it was already occupying like most of my time, and it was a full time uh, internship plus the studies. So, so yeah, it, uh, I think I was only focusing on both uh, uh, both ways and writing my thesis and defending. Uh, so yeah, I, I was mainly focusing on work and study. Uh, mainly but i took one extra uh, course uh, so uh, in total you need to fulfill 120 credits so i took 126 so i took six extra credits because i i the, there is a business certificate uh, that you can apply for if you take uh, around five uh, uh, business related courses you can apply for a business analysis certificate and uh, i was curious to take because i took already four of four of the courses so i had to take one extra uh, course in order to to get this business analysis certificate okay thank you that's a good tip for future students <laughs> yes okay let's take the next question um how does vault 2.0 help with ops when it coming to the evolution of the data warehouse so uh... So basically, uh, in Data Vault, um, you are trying to build an enterprise data warehouse that fits all the data uh, what you have, and uh, and uh, some people consider Data Vault as uh, like data lake 
exclusion because you dump the data as uh, as equal to the source system as possible. So it is like sort of uh, a data lake uh, solution. Uh, and also it is a data warehousing uh, part. So it is really an exciting uh, uh, method and uh, it's quite new as well because if you see like Kanban, it is already there for more than 15 or more or 20 years about uh, like dimensional modeling. But Data Vault is uh, 2.0 is quite new. It is released less than around 10 years ago. So it is a new uh, way of thinking of how to, to model uh, the data. Uh, and uh, it, it it works well with Agile. Uh, so you, you just build and uh, do iterations. And with every iteration, you extend your model. So it also follows a new uh, like uh, Agile uh, methodologies and uh, style of development. Any software development teams uh, can adapt it quite fast. OK, thank you. Um, so uh, the next question is, are you planning to stay in Estonia in the future? Uh, yes, uh, actually, I, I was asked that question several times, <laughs> especially like many people ask me why you choose Estonia in the first place. But uh, but yeah, when I when I was coming to Estonia, uh, I, I already was married and I have uh, kids and uh, I was a bit overwhelmed about going to a new country. And Estonia is not like a well known country where you, you just know about it uh, easily or even your friends knows about it. So I was a bit worried. It, but when I came here, it is a really nice and peaceful and uh, like me and my whole family, we, we like it. And uh, uh, coming from a crowded countries like Egypt, 120 million population <laughs> and staying in Estonia for us, it is like a heaven. <laughs> so so I think we are, we are planning to stay in Estonia. That is very nice to hear. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, we can... Take this question uh, next. Did you have a culture shock when you came to Estonia? Um, I don't uh, consider I had a shock. Uh, maybe because I stayed in the dorm uh, with several uh, uh, like colleagues, uh, students, and also uh, several Egyptian uh, uh, people, which I met uh, for the first time in Estonia. So I think this uh, like uh, uh, reduced the shock and made me feel more comfortable and uh, easy adapt. Uh, everyone have some experience. Some colleagues came one year earlier, so they shared their best practices. And uh, and yeah, I think we were a really nice uh, community, and uh, uh, this helped a lot to adapt uh, quicker uh, uh, in, in in the university so I, I i will recommend everyone to stay in the dorm <laughs> and it is a really nice place great did you live in the dorm uh, your entire studies uh uh, one year I, I stayed in the dorm for one year and in the second year I moved to Tallinn because I worked at South Bank uh, during study so I moved to Tallinn in my second year of studies but if I, I stayed in Tartu I, I will stay the whole two years uh, in, in the door it's you really had nice a good experience <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> okay so uh, let's take the next question Mm, uh, what technical skills did you have before applying for the software engineering master's program? Uh, okay, so uh, as I mentioned, I worked in the industry for more than eight years before I joined. It was mainly in IT. Uh, I worked as a database engineer, and then I worked as a uh, uh, the, the, like uh, Oracle uh, finance Oracle consultant, and then technical consultant, and uh, and the BI developer. So I had like lots of experience with uh, data related uh, uh, fields. Uh, it was mainly data, and it was mainly Oracle, uh, but when I came to Estonia, they don't use Oracle much. Uh, it is there, but uh, but yeah, not uh, not much. But uh, but still, like experience counts. So so uh, and it was not related to software engineering. So that's why I was very really excited to learn about it and uh, to expand my knowledge and uh, build on top of it. Okay, thank you. So next question is, what is your PhD about and why did you decide to become an external PhD? Uh, 
So I, I did my master's thesis in uh, in hackathons. Uh, so we traced uh, the hackathon uh, events and uh, the hackathon codes that they generate. And uh, we collected all the information from uh, open uh, like GitHub and all open source uh, uh, projects. And we traced that code, where it comes from and where it goes. So it was really an exciting idea. And even we published a paper uh, uh, during uh, studies, uh, during masters. So we sought to 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 extend uh, the work and uh, to continue working on that direction. So my PhD is about hackathons and about uh, uh, how to utilize hackathon in open source uh, uh, projects. And uh, why I decided to become an external PhD because uh, like uh, 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 I, I liked the idea initially and I like to extend it and also like doing PhD and uh, writing your thoughts in, in paper and uh, like representing it in some graphs. This makes you more uh, uh, expressive, like you can express yourself in a better way. So I, I think it will help me not directly in, in something related to work, but it will help me to, to organize my thoughts and uh, to, to be able to express and document it in a proper uh, way. So that is my uh, uh, motivation about it. Thank you. So uh, next question is, uh... What are you most proud of uh, of your studies at the University of Tartu? Uh, so I, I am proud to be part of University of Tartu. It is one of the top uh, uh, 2% uh, universities in the world. And uh, yeah, I'm really proud to, to be part of it. And it's quite known and uh, and uh, having high reputation. So, uh, so I, I am really proud of uh, being there. And uh, I, I'm also proud that I got this cum laude, which I didn't plan or uh, I didn't even know until I, uh, like two days before my uh, graduation ceremony, one of my colleagues just found that some way, uh, like uh, somewhere on the internet and he told me, hey, you got cum laude and <laughs> I didn't even expect it. So, <laughs> so it was quite nice. Uh, surprise yes that sounds like a very good surprise <laughs> <laughs> yes okay so uh did you receive a scholarship for your studies if yes which one um so when you apply to university of tartu when you get an offer from a university they also inform you if you get uh, like Twitter waiver or not. So I got Twitter waiver uh, from uh, my program, which was nice. So I didn't pay. And uh, also when, uh, but I didn't get uh, any scholarship before I come here. So I didn't get Dora, for example, the scholarship. Uh, but uh, when you come, you have several options. There are need-based uh, scholarships to which you can apply for. You, you also uh, there are uh, some uh, achievement scholarships. If you get high grades or A, I think you can apply for for that one as well. Uh, and I, I got this achievement scholarship, and also I got Dora scholarship, and in second year, and. Uh, uh, and I, I got the need-based one as well in the first year. So, so yeah, there are plenty of scholarships which you can apply and, uh, and yeah, uh, there are lots of support. Okay, thank you. So I think we will take our last question. So uh, what do you think about the student life in Dato? How is it in your opinion? Um, uh, like Tartu is really nice city. Uh, it is a student city, so it, like it is mainly it have lots of students. You will like see lots of students everywhere. Uh, it have uh, like uh, vape and pace and uh, like everywhere it's active and uh, you you can easily build a friendship with several several nationalities and uh, and yeah it's really uh, like nice and uh, the city itself is uh, quite neat and also compact so you can go anywhere uh, walking or uh, uh, taking a uh, uh, a, a bike or a scooter so uh, so it, it is really accessible and uh, you can do lots uh, with less time so you, you don't need to take public transportation much <laughs> in Tartu and uh, and I still go to Tartu from time to time I even take my family and go uh, for a day or two so so I, I really like it uh, it's not boring at all especially with friends 
Yes, thank you. Great. So uh, I believe we covered uh, almost all of the questions from our audience. I would like to thank our presenter Ahmed for sharing his experience and for a great talk on an interesting topic. And I hope to see you in Tartu. I wish you well in your PhD studies. And uh, yes, and thank you to our audience for being with us today. Uh, also a few things before we wrap up, if you're a future student and planning to apply to software engineering program this year, the application period has already started and the deadline is on 15 March. And uh, there is also going to be a virtual meeting with the program director where you can ask any questions you have regarding the program. And uh, we will send you the information along with the recording of today's talk. So uh, thank you again to everybody for joining us today, especially thank you to Ahmed and I wish you a nice evening. Thank you and thank you for listening everyone. Have a good day. You too, thank you, bye. Bye.